Yeah, excellent. So I'm Yanis from DDOB. Uh, DDOB, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of us, uh, but uh, the first question would be probably, who are we? Uh, we are a security company, and uh, our DNA comes from uh, research and technology and static analysis, so that's what uh, we are building on in most of our tooling. Uh, so if you know us, most likely you know us from this, from library.dw.com. Contract Library has been our free service for the past five years. Uh, people use it because it has the best EVM uh, bytecode decompiler. Uh, so any security researcher goes to us to reverse engineer uh, smart contracts that don't have source code, be it uh, bots or be it uh, hacks. Uh, people usually come to us uh, to reverse engineer them. And we are also a very active auditor. We are a high-end auditor, so we've done more than 200 audits uh, by quick count uh, for, for many high-profile customers. Uh, we are a pretty boutique audit uh, firm, and we've found many security vulnerabilities in the past couple of years. And you may have seen some of those uh, reports, like uh, maybe the primitive finance, which has been pretty visible. Uh, but in total, we've had significant uh, success in finding bounties uh, on deployed DeFi protocols. So we've gotten more than 10 bounties, and we found many more vulnerabilities, actually. Uh, gotten more than 3 million. And may I want to thank everyone who has given us a bounty throughout the years. Uh, but that's really our background. We are a security company. We are building analysis technology. We analyze code, and we do audits. Now, what I'd like to do today is discuss a couple of technical tidbits. Uh, hopefully, you know, they will be new and exciting, a couple of them at least. Uh, so without further ado, let's start with what I cannot not mention, uh, which is phantom functions. This has been the source of the largest vulnerability we ever found. Uh, this, if it would have been hacked and not white hat hacked, it would have been more than a billion dollars in value uh, by far. And its basis, technically, is very, very simple. So I think I can go through this in about three minutes. Uh, so the vulnerable contract, the actual uh, code that had the vulnerability, has features that look like this. We have a deposit function. And I'm going to be pointing to the, to, uh, to the screen on the right. I hope everyone can see the right. I don't see any obstacles in the middle. So, uh, so we have a deposit function that looks perfectly safe. And it would be perfectly safe on its own, because I have a token. And I call transfer from on that token. But to do the transfer from, who has to have given approval to, to the contract to spend its token? The message sender like the initiator of the deposit transaction. So this is perfectly safe on its own, because I call transfer from, I'm the one who has authorized spending my money, and I'm the one who's calling deposit. I'm the message sender. Otherwise, this would not work. And there's a second function that also on its own looks perfectly safe. It's deposit with permit. Uh, if you are a Solidity developer, you may know the permit call. Uh, permit is supported by many ERC tokens. It's a way to integrate off-chain signatures, off-chain approvals for a contract to spend my tokens. So here I have a call to token.permit, and I pass a cryptographic signature that proves that I signed, I actually asked for the, token, for the contract to spend my money. And then it does a transfer from, that's not as safe as this one, because it transfers from any target that the caller specifies to the contract. Now, of course, what makes the second line safe is the permit. This second line, in theory, is only reached if the caller has given me a cryptographic signature that says that this contract is permitted to do this transfer from, and the target has actually done this permission. Now, the bug in this code is very insidious if you haven't seen phantom functions. And if you haven't, I'm inviting you to think of what the permit function looks like for wrapped Ether, the first, the foremost ERC20 token that just wraps native Ether on Ethereum. And if you haven't seen it, it's an interesting revelation. Three, two, one, there is no permit. But there is a permit at the same time because there is a fallback function. And the fallback function functions as a catch-all. So when I call permit on wrapped ether, 
actually, this is the code that gets executed. That never says permit anywhere. It's just the fallback function. So the transaction is not reverting. I called permit. It's not supported. But it is supported. Something gets executed. So this is what we call a phantom function. Phantom function is one that the contract does not define explicitly, but it accepts calls to it without reverting. So what's the bug now here? The bug is that this line becomes a no-op for wrapped ether. This token.permit silently succeeds without doing anything. And then we get to this unsafe transfer from, and we can take any target's money and move it to our account, which is held with this contract. But what we don't have approvals to do the transfer from. Oh, yes, we do. We do because of the top call. Anyone, and in practice, this was many thousands of users, anyone who has ever used this function on top has given the contract approval to spend its tokens. And now we are using the function below, and we're getting these tokens ourselves because the permit becomes a no-op. So that's fun phantom functions. Uh, if you had seen it, sorry, uh, but most people have not, and it's really an interesting technical tidbit. And I think it's, it shows how things can go wrong in code in very, very insidious ways sometimes. So with this, I'm going to continue to the main part of my talk, which are technical tidbits, but also higher level tidbits from audits that we have conducted. As I was saying earlier, uh, as a company, we've done more than 200 total audits. That's a quick count, but I did count 64 audits since last September. So let's say in the last 12 months, we've had about uh, 60 audits. Uh, what, what counts as an audit? Anything that has its individual audit report. And now I can give you statistics, and I've seen statistics like that in multiple talks that say, for instance, this is true for us, say about one third of our audits find critical vulnerabilities, uh, but you can question if you are a little skeptical, does this mean anything? You call it critical, maybe someone else will not. And in fact, most of the time, uh, what we call high would be called critical by others. So like, for instance, our latest audit that had another auditor uh, found one low that another auditor rated, another auditing company rated high, and we had several advisory items that the other auditor rated low. So clearly, the ratings themselves are kind of subjective, and we are typically being a little more conserv conservative, a little more subdued, but it means something that we find pretty serious vulnerabilities in, mo in a, a large proportion, one third of our audits roughly. Now, what are these vulnerabilities? Uh, many of you have gone through an audit process before, uh, so you have an idea of what kinds of things auditors look for, but very quickly, the big thing about auditing is it can find issues at all different levels. That's why you employ human auditors. They can review the protocol level. They can even review the financials. So we may find threats that have to do with price manipulation or gaming the system generally. We can have system level threats, for instance, anything that has to do with the distributed systems aspects of the execution. We can have denial of service, we could have front running, we can have consensus violation, uh, we can have Sybil attacks, like maybe someone can create multiple fake accounts and have them count as many when it's really one entity behind them. And of course, at the lowest level, we have code level threats, and there, all bets are off. We could have logic errors, we could have re-entrances, which is a common attack vector uh, in EVM code. We could have rounding errors. We, had, we could have very simply wrong mathematical assumptions. So we have found many, many such issues throughout the years. And not going to lie, I've lost sleep several times or a couple of times, actually, over things that maybe we didn't find. So we've had a few regrets, uh, no hacks so far. Uh, but then again, I'm pretty happy that we haven't had too many regrets over such a large number of audits. Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job overall. So I could, see, I could show many, many examples of actual interesting technical aspects. But instead, I'd like to talk about a systemic failure of our development patterns. This is something that I think is a little more interesting because it applies to pretty much any project. Uh, I've found it pretty surprising how 
most people are not too aware of the really bad interaction between upgradable contracts and solidity inheritance. Those two things really don't go together very well. So how do we do upgradable contracts in EVM, uh, in Solidity? So we have a contract that gets replaced by a new implementation, and it gets accessed by a front-end contract, a proxy, that actually keeps the storage, actually keeps the, the data, the actual persistent data on chain. So every time we upgrade, we have to make sure that the logic that replaces the old logic, expects the variables to be at the same place. So to be a little more, to use uh, the lingo, the storage layout, meaning the ordering of on-chain variables, has to stay the same. And there are many conventions. If you've used libraries for upgradability, you may have seen gaps where we don't put state variables, storage variables sequentially, but we have gaps of 50 between them or something. Uh, we have libraries that we can be using. But this is all like really a bad interaction. So let me try to give an example. This is anonymized code, so everything that I have uh, underlined is not the real name. Everything else is the real name. Uh, from a tiny, tiny audit. This is an audit of about 200 lines of code. There were 200 original lines, and everything else is inherited from open Zeppelin libraries. And you can see library contracts here, like ERC20 permit upgradable, uh, Semver, pausable with access, etc. So very simple code base, original, inherits from libraries, and here's the inheritance hierarchy. It goes like this. You can see it's pretty complicated already, and that's just the first page. The programmer, the programmers actually just wrote effectively the first line. Everything else is from that point on. Actually, it's one more line that's specific to that project. It goes on like something like this, and everything pretty much on the second page is inside the open Zeppelin in libraries. So what happens here when we truly try to upgrade? This is very, very hard to get right. If I add an extra contract in my inheritance hierarchy at any point, the linearization of super contracts can change, and my storage can be completely upset. And this is also a huge burden for the library writers themselves. This plays very badly with libraries. If you think about it, what does, say, open Zeppelin upgradable libraries, what do they have to do? They have to respect exactly the same linearization of inheritance hierarchies everywhere here. They cannot, in the next version, go and change this, for instance, and instead of possible upgradable being, easy example, initializable, comma, context upgradable, have it be context upgradable, comma, initializable, or add another contract in the middle. They simply cannot do that. And that goes against the exact nature of libraries. Libraries are supposed to be for information hiding. Uh, it's supposed to be something that just gives me one little thing. I reuse it, and I don't care about go what goes on inside it. With upgradability, I don't have this property. So that's a really bad pattern that I do point out. People are mostly not aware of it. Clearly, if you're using upgradable contracts, you have to use tooling to look at the storage layout every time you upgrade. And this is exactly what limits upgradability in Solidity to just fixing bugs. Now, I don't have to go through the last part of my talk. Uh, I have given the last part before. It's not original. Uh, up until this point, there were some original stuff. Uh, but feel free to uh, talk to me about the unpleasant truths of auditing, which is also a standard document that we share with audit clients. And with that, since I'm out of time, I'll just go to the end. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.